Musically, I mean, I, I recorded with uh, Nelson Riddle, you know, I recorded American Standard songs at a time when American pop music had decided that American Standard songs needed to ride up and down in elevators for the rest of their natural lives. I have It was a shame because I think what the United States gave the world at large culturally was the American popular song. And f by far the best, the most beautifully crafted, the most complex, and the most artistic of all uh, American popular songs is, is the American standard song, um, you know, uh, a la George Gershwin or Rogers and Hart. I mean, those guys were just brilliant, brilliant, brilliant composers, both orchestrally and in terms of the way they crafted their lyrics so that they were multiple layered. They could be as intellectual as you wanted them to be. They could be just about a broken heart. They could be about the fact that you lost your job. It could be all those things in one song. And anybody at any level could relate to it. And that is a brilliant thing to be able to do. No small task. As Linda Ronstadt's career flourished, so did her curiosity. And music became a way to reconnect with her heritage. Linda's childhood memories of singing folk songs with her Mexican-American father inspired her to open up a part of her life that had been mostly hidden from her fans. And she decided to record an album in Spanish. You know, I didn't do it because it was a career move. <laughs> I did it because... I love Mexican music passionately. I love the culture passionately, and I wanted to explore it. They had the guys in there that, that knew the traditions beautifully and were very generous with their time to, to, to help to teach me. I, I knew a lot of it from my childhood growing up, but I didn't know it as a grown-up lady singer or as a professional. I just knew it kind of three or four lines and then la, 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 la. So I sat with them and they taught me, and we went on the road together, and when I was on the road, they taught me more. It was just a fabulous experience. But when you started it, when you decided to go in this direction, was there someone around you, an agent, perhaps someone in your family said, listen, don't do this, this is, this is a bad career move. My no, manager no. said, what are you talking about? I told my record company, and this was after I'd already done the Nelson Riddle stuff with the standards, and they, they were sure I just completely lost my mind. And I said, please, let me do this. I've sold so many records for you. Let me just have this as a, as a self-indulgence, if nothing else. But I'm just determined to do this, and this is what I'm going to do. But, you know, uh, there's another thing that happens. I think because of racism, it's happened to African-Americans too, but because of racism, there's a huge portion of the, of the community out there that's simply invisible. Mexican-Americans fall into that category. They don't realize that they have tremendous buying power, that they have a lot of opinions about things they like and they dislike. And when we went to do our concerts, we, we weren't sure who was going to show up because we didn't think the rock and roll people were going to show up. And they, they didn't particularly, some of them turned out. But what really came were these Mexican-American families. It was the grandmother, the grand, you know, the grandchildren, the, the kids. The and the grandparents were remembering these songs because they're from earlier time, earlier in the 20th century, and they were remembering that they were their songs of courtship, you know. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is they scared the promoters to death everywhere we went because they don't, Mexicans are not in a big hurry, so they didn't go and buy tickets in advance. They just walk up and buy tickets when they got there. So every single night when we would open, we wouldn't know if anybody was going to show up. Well, because advance sales were late. <laughs> advance sales weren't weren't good, but the place was always full of brown faces and all these you know kids and grandmothers. It was fabulous, and they always knew the right place to yell. Like lots of times in, with a rock and roll audience, I'll be singing some tender ballad like Desperado, and they'll go, "Hey, wave," you know, right in the middle of the like. But Mexicans. They just catch you on the beginning of the emotion when you're about to have a, an emotional climax, and they go, yeah, you know, they'll start hollering, and, it's, and it just moves you along. They know exactly how to keep you going. It's really neat. It's a very different kind of an audience. For much of her career, Linda Ronstead broke boundaries, and it began early. Rock and roll was, by and large, a man's game in the 1970s when Ronstead appeared, but her success helped change that. Thinking that at a at a young age, because you were a precocious top flight performer, there weren't that many women, correct me if I'm wrong, who were performing at or near the top with 
some of the greatest names in rock music. What was that like? Well, we were confused a lot. I think we had strange... Uh, we didn't know whether we were supposed to be domestic and nurturing and at home sewing and cooking and taking care of our men, you know, and minding babies, or whether we were supposed to be independent and out there running around, you know, redefining the universe. It was complicated. And to, to add to that, Rolling Stone, in its infinite wisdom, had declared that, you know, funk was God at some point. And everybody was chasing funk. So I dressed myself up like Moonbeam McSwine and I got in a pen with pigs and I had my picture taken for my album cover because I was just trying to make fun of that, you know. I thought if you can't get funkier, you can't get funkier than sitting in a, pit, in a big pen. <laughs> well, for the uninitiated, and that would include me, what's the difference between funk and rock and roll? You know, funk had a whole other concept in terms of, of you know, you had to have really hard rocking, you know, clearly defined rhythm somehow kind of scratchy guitars i don't know what it meant you know people people that try to make those hard and fast rules aren't musicians they really aren't musicians are just chasing a dream they're chasing a story they're trying to tell a story in some kind of way and you make these decisions about what kinds of guitar textures you want what kind of vocal textures you want at incredibly fast speed without any kind of there's no real conscious deciding you're not thinking oh today i'm going to go growly in my voice you know you're just singing and for me it was always running a tape i was running like a film of, of a story in my mind and i was just describing it in sound so you know when when people try to say well you know you have to sound like this in order to be in this category of music rock and roll well, what is that i don't know i mean i never thought of myself as a rock and roll singer i thought of myself as a singer who sometimes sang rock and roll and sometimes sang mexican music and sometimes sang standard songs and sometimes saying operetta, you know, if I could get away with it, I'd try it because I admired it. You were viewed as being absolutely the bombshell. You were <laughs> totally successful with your music and over a wide range of music. Surely someone said to you, Lydia, you should get married. You can have any man in the world. No, I couldn't have. You know, it, it always looks like there's a line at the front, front door, but really it's not what is it? In the beginner's mind, there are many choices. In the Zen mind, there is only one. That's an old Zen koan. You know, there's a bunch of guys that want you. I don't know if they, what they want. You never thought about getting married. Well, no. maybe when I was three and wanted a wedding dress. I don't know. You know. <laughs> well, why do you suppose that is? I think my mother might have had something to do with that. You know, not that she. I don't think my mother had an unhappy marriage. I think she had a very happy marriage. Mm -hmm. But my mom wanted to be a scientist and World War II came along right at the point when she was starting with a kind of a low level science job that she would have been able to work up in. And she had three kids to raise, four kids eventually. And I think that it was always a little bit of a disappointment. She used to go back to school from time to time and sort of get more, you know, learn more stuff. But I think she always sort of said to me, go out and have a life. You know, you don't just have to get married. There are alternatives to it. But eventually, you wanted children. I did want children, yeah. But I have two adopted children. And as objectively as you can, very hard to be objective about this, what kind of life did they have? As you, you were still on the road, you were still I was a on the road. I pretty much quit traveling when they were born. You know, I really wanted to be there. I didn't want to miss anything. Um, I quit for, while they were little. I didn't go on the road at all. And then as they got a little bit older, I started finding out how much it cost to put them in school. <laughs> I found out how much tuition in a private school they almost had a heart attack. But and then I'd arrange to go on the road in the summer when they could go with me. And they loved it because we didn't have any TV at my house. So we'd get on the bus and they could watch TV. Do your children they're both what in their twenties now? One's nineteen and one's okay. twenty two. Okay. They're almost grown. <laughs> <laughs> but do they have a sense what a world megastar you were at the height of your career? I was just mom, you know. I was mom, get me another glass of milk. Um, my daughter, for instance, didn't, until she was about eight years old, didn't know I'd ever sung in, in English because I sang in Spanish the whole time that I was in all of her childhood. We were on the road with a Mexican band and she had Mexican costumes, you know, that she would wear. She was learning to dance with her skirts around. My son one time asked me, mom, why didn't you ever sing rock and roll? <laughs> so, you know, they like something else. They're interested in different kind of music. But now we're 2013 and you have a book. Uh, why this book and why now? Well, so many people have written things about me and they said I thought this and they said I said that and they said I sang this for this reason or that and there was so, about 99% of the time that it was inaccurate. <laughs> so I thought it would be, you know, a chance to set the record straight. 
I'm a reader, but I'm not a writer. I never kept a journal. I never kept a diary. I don't have any craft or skill. You know, I was, I was actually, I was at dinner with a fellow named Michael Pollan, who's written one of my favorite books, The Botany of Desire. I don't know him very well, but he was sitting next to me at dinner one night and he said, are you going to write a book? And I said, are you crazy? I don't know how to write a book. And he said, well, he said he thought that everybody had one great story that they could pull out of themselves. And so I went home and I thought about that for a while. And about a week later, somebody from, uh, you know, a big publishing company called me and said, they'd be interested in a book about my work. Not, it didn't have to be terribly personal. It didn't have to be a kiss and tell book. And I said, that might be interesting, you know? So um, I decided that maybe my experiences might help another singer, or I, at least I could get my side of the story out there. You know, why I did the things I did. So I just followed the music, my musical path. I didn't vary from that. Linda Ronstadt knows that her career has had many high notes, and she is philosophical about the medical struggles she now must face. She may never sing again, but that doesn't mean she is willing to leave the world of music behind. You know, I just figure by the time you're 67, someone's going to get you. And that got me, you know, got it from my grandmother. She had Parkinson's too. So she gave me some really good genes and she, she passed me that one too. And I just think, you know, what am I doing with my time? I don't have a lot of energy and a lot of strength, but I have a lot of, I still have a lot of feeling for the things that I believe in. There's a group called the Los Ensodles that work out of a little cultural center in the East Bay in Northern California over in Richmond. And they're just doing brilliant work with children, just brilliant work. But they're teaching them how to play the deep Mexican traditional Mexican music, the, the deep traditions of the music and the dance and playing how to play their instruments. And that's my passion right now and my main connection with music because I go over and I see these kids learning the things that I struggled to learn and they're doing it way better and way earlier than I did. So that's what I do right now. I watch those kids, it's their turn now. It's, I, feel, I always say to myself, if I'm gonna feel sorry for myself, I always say I had a really long turn at the trough. <laughs> <laughs> Is that just that? Anything.